there's a saying that politics is downstream from culture, meaning that the politics of a country is dependent on that country's culture. So what does it say about our culture in Trinidad and Tobago when it seems like all of our politics devolves into race? With yesterday being a rival day, I thought it a good occasion to watch the history of indentureship in Trinidad and see with the after effects of years of colonialism and the after effects of the decisions made during the colonial times, the decision made as it pertains to the indentured workers and the decisions made as it pertains to the slaves and the freed slaves and how those decisions impacted us even up till now. In our country, in case anyone doesn't know, the politics is divided by and large by the two prominent races, the African race and the Indian race. Now, those are generalizations because people that consider themselves African may not all be African and people that consider themselves Indian may not all be Indian. And either way, we are both Trinidadians and we both belong to the ethnic group of Trinis. If ethnicity is to pertain to having common traditional practices and being part of a common subgroup, I think all of us in Trinis would be part of a common subgroup. If you attempt to go back to wherever else you may think is your motherland, most likely they wouldn't accept you because they would see you as not being from there. Once you're here for so long, I'm sorry you're stuck unless you decide to pick up yourself and immigrate from here also, you're stuck here as a Trinidadian. So it makes sense for us to try to go back through our history to see what is causing some of this friction. Can we even solve some of this friction to find out the accurate facts about history in terms of the literal what happened, how long it happened, who it happened to? This, you have to depend on somebody writing it down and being honest about their characterization of the events that they found. And then on top of all of that, that is still without the context of whatever the history was. So maybe, the, so maybe in history, you may see this one group, this one tribe that killed out another tribe and it may seem atrocious to you. It may seem like some real horrible part in history and this tribe that did the killing should be painted as the villains. But maybe if you rewind history, probably for 50 years before that, you'd see that this tribe was attacked and they are just reacting to it. So history gets more complex than that. It is said in the stages of grief that the first step is denial. And I think that a lot of people are in denial about certain aspects in our country. For example, I did a contemplation this week gone about the about our Prime Minister saying that he blames the Andrea Barrett vigils, etc. I considered this statement very foolish, but in the contemplation I pointed out that I noted there were racial undertones in the vigils. And I saw in the comments some people were appalled by this. They said that I was trying to be a victim. A victim of what? I am not sure. But they, they didn't see any of the racial undertones in it. And I think that's denial. If you can look at something like that in Trinidad and look at the conversations that go along with it. You, I'm not saying, racial undertones doesn't necessarily mean you are a racist. It means that some of the some of the undercurrents, some of what is not said and what is suggested in the actions that are taking place have certain racial stereotypes that they are projecting. Anytime it comes to questioning matters of race, it becomes very easy to call you a racist. So if I ask a question about any other race than mine and the, quest and the question is critical of the particular race, then it's very easy to call me a racist. But I find that very counterproductive to furthering our nation and furthering the discussions that we ourselves continuously say that we have to have. It could be very difficult to get people to agree on certain matters of history. What they think is true and what they think is representative of the actual factual events that occurred. And colonizing history and the history of the colonies is especially particularly bad at this representation because a lot of the colonizing history was written by the colonizers. So you, are, you tend to believe that they would have written this history with a sympathetic slant to their own cause. But if you are to attempt to study history and learn the lessons from it, then we have to take it as it is given to us and possibly get as many sources in it as we can to get a more even and all-rounded view of it. I found a research paper from the Louisiana State University and this paper was written way back in 1969. It has some age tape. And why I chose this paper is because I found that this research paper was very well sourced. 
They, it's not that they are writing this from their own repository of knowledge, from their own heads. They are writing it based on research that they did and they have the links to all of the research there. Some of their research would have been from Eric Williams' books and some would have been from other Caribbean authors. So if you'd like to read a nice full history of East Indian indentureship in Trinidad and how it formed and the different parts of it, then I would leave the link to this paper, to this research paper in the description. Feel free to click it and read it. I am obviously not going to read through the entire thing. It is all of nearly 200 pages and we don't have that much time and I don't think you would even listen to me for that long. Before we dive head first into our whole research paper, if you like the video and you like the content, well, like the video, subscribe if you aren't subscribed yet, and click the notification bell so that you know exactly when the videos drop. I'm trying to create some new content out here. We are actually going to attempt to read through pieces of a research paper on East Indian indentureship in Trinidad. Who would have thought that this is what makes YouTube videos and makes entertainment? If you like this kind of content, well, share it. Hopefully some other people like it and we can uplift some of the conversations we are having in Trinidad. So, a history of the East Indian indentured plantation worker in Trinidad, 1845 to 1917. This history starts somewhere around 1797, when the British took Trinidad from the French and the British brought with them their plantation style of governance, their plantation style of running colonies. But then, to the astonishment of the colonizers and plantation owners, the slaves were found to actually have been humans all along. And then, you can't mistreat them if they're humans, so now they must emancipate these slaves. They weren't happy about the idea. And the colonizers had this whole idea of now having to pay for labor shoved on them when it's not exactly what they wanted. Transition from slave to free labor. The question of labor was forced upon the planters with the end of slavery and apprenticeship. The work habits of the emancipated slave made it even more imperative. The planter was compelled to choose between the alternatives open to him if the sugar industry was to close. The paper quotes Dr. Eric Williams here, the first prime minister of our country, when he, when he says, when he spoke about the ending of slavery and the fact that he believes the ending of slavery wasn't predominantly because that people's hearts became soft and people began to become caring. The ending of slavery was because it was no longer tenable. It was no longer profitable for the colonizers to continue going on with the slavery apparatus and with the slavery mechanism for creating resources. What I found very interesting in this was the views that the planters and the plantation owners had concerning the slaves. Listen to this. However, they feared that the peasants would live idly in villages and work only two or three days a week for wages. This, to the planters, would be immoral and a regression to barbarism. So, if these people have the options to not be slaves to us, that's a regression from civilized living because civilized living is them having to work their backs off for us while we can sit idly and we can sip the tea and work only the three days a week because we are better people on this earth. Those great caring colonists looking out for the civility of mankind. And this now brings us to India. And at this time, Britain was already in India doing their own nefarious activities and Basically oppressing the Indians that were, there at that, that were there at that time and eventually taking over India and running it basically as a British colony. So this allowed Britain special access to India and they used that access. The Indian workers were already being used. India already had some plantations there that already grew sugar. The Indian workers were already being used on Mauritius, another one of the islands, and in some other British colonies. So the Indian workers were tried and true and they were trusted. But India provided some unique situations that made it conducive even to the British doing what they did. Because India had the caste system. And while it's said and assumed that the majority of indentured laborers that came to Trinidad and came to the Western world as a whole would have been from lower castes, not class, castes, because it's, it seems pretty obvious that the higher castes being generally wealthier would have less motivation to leave. But then what, that has to be put into context with the fact that the majority of indentured laborers came from a specific Indian province called Uttar Pradesh being the most densely populated of provinces in India. And even since then, 
over a hundred years ago, it was already very densely populated. Now, what happens when an area is densely populated? And bear in mind, at that point in time, the vast majority of people would have been peasant farmers. So you have densely populated and then you have the majority of people being involved in agriculture and farming. And one of the most key parts of agriculture and farming is land. You need land to farm. So if you have dense population combined with everybody being farmers, what's going to eventually happen is you'd end up with very few landowners and a lot of people who are only laborers and only working. So that is what was happening in the Uttar Pradesh province. And then to combine and make this whole situation perfect for the British picking, the British came in there and they eventually began to rule in India. So there was more oppression against the peasants and against the laborers in this region. So now that creates a push factor against the Indian laborers. They are being oppressed in their homeland. The, the British have come in now and now the delicate balance they had between labor and landowner is now born and the landowner has more power than he had before. And on top of it now, you see that the British are advertising tempting work on the other side of the world. So now we have the setting made for bringing the East Indians over across the world to Trinidad. And we see a letter written as early as 1814 from one governor, Ralph Woodford, that name should ring a bell to Trinidadians. And he wrote to the Secretary of State for the Colonies, Mr. Earl Bathurst, the cultivators of Hindustan referring to India are known to be peaceable and industrious An extensive introduction of that class of people accustomed to live on the produce of their own labor only and listen to this piece, totally withdrawn from African connections or feelings would probably be the best experiment for the population of this island. So from the very beginning, the interest and the, and the idea was that these people, these workers that they want to bring, they want them disconnected from the African workers that they already had there. So division seems to have been a part of the original planning of this. And it makes sense because when you study the colonial style of governance, it was a minority government, meaning that the leaders, the colonists, were the minority of the societies that they ran. So you wouldn't want the people in the underclasses in this society to have unity together. So if I'm importing a whole new group, a whole new class of workers, I would have interest in knowing that this class of workers will not, will not associate with the other class of workers that I already have there. We want them to remain separate. And that was part of the interest in them. So from that, we had the recruitment process. How did the recruitment process begin? The recruitment process worked with the British remaining on the ports for the most part and hiring local recruiters to go inland to fetch for them the immigrants and allow them to sign the contracts. And then they would bring them back onto the port and then they would sail with them. Now, imagine for me for a moment, what do you think would happen if you are paying men to go inland and bear in mind, this would have been in the 1800s. It's not like it was. It had legendary human rights campaigns back then. Paying men to go inland and fetch for you people to carry away to work. That sounds a lot like slavery. But it was not. And that's one of the arguments that keeps going. One of the differences, there were many differences. But one of the differences was that, was that there were contracts to be signed. But then when you think about it, many of the workers that were signing these contracts couldn't read. They couldn't read any of the languages the contracts were written in. And sometimes they couldn't speak some of the languages the contracts were written in. So what do you call it when you get a worker to sign over years of his life without understanding the contract he signed? In modern times, I feel the proper name for that would have been crime. Very often what would happen is the conditions that the indentured laborers found themselves in would fluctuate. When it was left just up to those who had interest in maximizing their profits, the conditions would quickly deteriorate and eventually the, the indentured workers would be living and surviving in conditions very similar to slavery. And then you would have someone stepping in to try and speak on the indentured workers' behalf and making the conditions a bit better. And that was kind of the way it went. It never quite got good. It got really bad and then got a bit better. And then after being recruited, there's the voyage from India to the Caribbean. Anyone who has any idea about geography will know that that is a very long trip. Eventually, the trip was shortened because the Suez Canal, the Suez Canal was opened, passing through the middle between Africa and Asia. So that cut the ride a bit, but the ride never was quite a safe ride. 
and there were lots of deaths, particularly in the early around in the earlys around 1845. For the first few years of the trips, sometimes something near like 10 percent of the passengers would die, of the laborers going across would die. But eventually that number decreased some, to somewhere around 2% only coming down to the end as sailing itself became simpler and technology increased. And then after all of this was complete, the Indian indentured laborers finally set foot on Trinidad, then to be distributed among the plantations on the island. They were pre predominantly employed in the sugar industry and after a while in the cocoa industry also. And to me reading history, I think a lot of the problems we see in our society that we are currently experiencing began to happen right around this point, when the indentured laborers began fitting into their places in the colonial society. They were workers, they weren't slaves, they were paid. But a lot of the pay was paid in a manner that the, the, the plantation would have a store on the plantation site and they may pay you in, as it were, trusting some goods in, some credit with goods from the plantation store. So what they are aiming to do is trap you forever in owing the plantation. And eventually, there would be no exchange of money. You would work for them and they would just give you food. Eventually, hoping there would be no exchange of money, you would just work for them and they would give you food, feed you, house you, and you give them work. And again, that sounds very similar to slavery. Bear in mind, many of the plantation owners weren't interested in stopping slavery. So they would have loved if they could have had slavery 2.0 and work away into figuring out how to make these indentured laborers into slaves. But they weren't. They worked and they had wages. And the wages was one of the main parts that set them apart from slaves because what this allowed was some saving. So the indentured laborers that came would have had as a part of their culture, as a part of their early culture, uh, an immense amount of frugality. Because when you're being paid a pittance and the colonial masters are attempting to take that money from you at any chance they get, you have to be pretty good at saving to save. And I think some of the extra good saving ability we see in our Indian brothers and sisters may have stemmed from some of those days, understanding how to still eke out a saving even while working under extremely oppressive conditions. But our indentured laborers were set up to run into friction from the very beginning because the position that they were brought in to fill was a position that was created as a comparative and replacement position. Remember, they are now filling the role of former slaves. So inevitably, there will be comparisons. And the old famous saying that comparison is the thief of joy worked out to be true. Three years after the arrival of the first Indians in Trinidad, I'm reading directly here from the paper, three years after, many of the planters and managers appeared to be pleased with the work the Indians were performing. The manager of Cedar Hill and Forest Hill Estates, Mr. Mackenzie, had over 100 Indians working under his supervision. And he found the Indians to be, and listen to these words, industrious, cheerful, contented, docile, obedient. A colored manager of Windsor Park Estate thought the Indians were better workers than Negro Creoles. The proprietor of Union Hall Estate in South Naprima, Horatio Huggins, felt the Indians were, and listen again, less easily offended, devoid of the savage, unruly disposition of the African. In cases where the indentured Indians left the estates on which they were employed, most proprietors concluded that it resulted from bad management or ill treatment. Now, after you spend hundreds of years whipping people into being savage animals, to go compare them to people you brought now and that are already in horrible conditions but they are being paid and their interests are being sought, to compare them to people that you have beat into being savages is unfair. And now what that creates, and it's it's kind of ingenious in an evil way, because what that creates is the, is the African Creole, as they call them, the former slaves would now be watching the Indians and you would be comparing yourself to them also. Instead of you watching the colonizers that created the system that oppressed slaves into being savages and then condemned them for being savages and then compared them to the East Indians that they brought who didn't know the language and all they had was each other, so all they did was keep in as a unit. 
and then compare those two and pit them against each other. That's kind of an ingenious amount of evil when you think about it. The very next paragraph explains one of the key differences between the treatment of the slaves and the treatment of the indentured laborers. Governor Harris had been compelled to remove indentured Indians from Clydesdale Cottage Estate in South Naparima because the proprietor was known for hitting and kicking the Indians. Where has it ever been that slaves would have been removed from an estate because they were abused, because they were hit and kicked? That was par for the course for a slave. That's what they were accustomed to. That was just Monday morning. Oh, they kicked me? Oh, that was just Tuesday. That was part of being a slave. The indentured laborers had that part a little different. The, the culture that they were... The culture that they came into and worked into was horrible, was oppressive, but it wasn't exactly chattel slavery. But at the same time, that wasn't the indentured laborers' fault. They didn't come here to be compared to slaves. They didn't come here seeking to put themselves in this comparison. They came to work and they came and had a horrible time at it because they were being tricked at the same time also. They were being promised that you have five years and after the five years, we promise you that we'll pay you and pay back your return voyage to India. So hopefully you just work for this five years and then you'll go back home. But then... The colonists got smart. The plantation owners got smart. They decided that you can. What was needed to to qualify for your for your ride home was yes, five years of labor. Yes, you needed the five years of labor. But then you needed ten years of residence in Trinidad. So you needed to stay in the island for a further five years on top of your five working years, and then you would qualify for being able to go home. Oh, but then on top of that, they're offering you work for the next five years because they don't want you out there just wandering around. And then they added even more on top of that. The, the ride back was once supposed to be free because it was supposed to be that the colonists, the plantation owners would pay that ride back. Eventually, they got it up to the to the indentured worker having to pay half of the trip back to India. And it's no surprise that a lot of people didn't take that offer. As great as India may have been for them, they, they aren't working for large amounts of money here. And if they take all of that money and attempt to use it to go back to India, they may have nothing when they reach. And then it, would make, it wouldn't have made any sense that they left India in the first place and came here to work. So I understand why a lot stayed. And with this thing, also keep in mind that many of the Indians that came, came with families. And if they didn't come with families, a lot of them made families while they were here. And there were measures in place to keep families together among the indentured laborers. That again is a major difference between them and the Africans. The families were encouraged, were actively encouraged in the indentured laborers. And they were allowed to move and request a transfer to a plantation if they married or, cho or chose to cohabitate with someone with an indentured laborer from another plantation. They were allowed to request a transfer and they can all live together. And then when you're thinking about it, you could understand a different kind of work etiquette with that manner. Because these people are here, they are, peasant, they are peasant workers, they are working for very little bit of money, but they have a family to see about. There's a motivation for them to continue working and for a different intensity in their work. The Africans didn't have that. They were slaves, there was no hope, there wasn't much family encouraged. All you had to look forward to was more work tomorrow and more abuse. And now, here we are. Trinidad and Tobago, over a hundred years down the road, still reeling from the impacts of things that occurred way before a lot of us were born, and still seeing the mirrored actions and reactions from colonial powers that have long left our governance system. We are now supposed to be in charge of our own destinies, but yet still a lot of the pitting against each other that was introduced by the colonial powers for colonial ends and colonial interests are still being utilized by the government in our position, as cruel and wicked and evil as a lot of the colonists were. They were just displaying a lot of human nature because some of the same techniques that they utilized to pit one set of people against another set of people to remain in positions of power is still being used. And so many of us are still falling for it. A lot of the division that a lot of us are fighting over are things that aren't even really relevant to us. I wasn't a slave Neither were any of the Indians that are still. I wasn't a slave. Neither were many of the. In I wasn't a slave. Neither were the vast majority of people with Indian history. 
I wasn't a slave, neither would the vast majority of people in Trinidad with Indian heritage indentured laborers. Their ancestors would. And yes, we have consequences to bear leading down from those ancestors. But we also have the opportunity to create new paths and create new destinies for ourselves. We can decide the type of interactions we want to choose to have with each other. If I am no longer a slave and you're no longer an indentured laborer, we aren't beholden to the stereotypes that were given to those two characters. We don't have to interact with each other with the assumptions of those two characters. So firstly, the indentured laborers were offered land 10 acres of crown land instead of being given the opportunity and given the passage to go back home. Most of them didn't want it. Not because they wanted to go home, but if they were given the passage to go home, they could go squat on free land and use the passage as their own money. Some people, however, did take the land and an investigation was done to see what was happening with the land that was given to them. There were many causes for failure that the investigator found in the land giving procedures and I found them so pertinent to current times. A third cause of failure was the assumption that making the settlement wholly Indian would ensure its success when the actual fact was that Indians were unable to learn from each other. Whatever agricultural experience they might have had in India was 10 years behind them. Now, he was talking about the agricultural ability and the loss of agricultural ability you had when you made the settlements totally Indian. But then, when you think about it, another one of the factors that would have happened by making the settlements totally Indian is you're ensuring the insularity of the Indian culture. And then now we see the result of it. Many of the settlements that were made since way back then still remain very insular in the Indian culture. And that creates some difficulty in modern times as to accusations of racism and discrimination, etc. But what that also did was create for some survival in the moments that they did have it. And the fourth point that the investigator noted was a fourth cause for failure was the fact that the land chosen for settlements was, avail was available only because no man would buy it. They gave these people wasteland. Land that no one wanted. After all the plantation owners decided to pick all the best land, they gave these the land that no one wanted anymore. A second investigator adding to that point noted that the government allotted crown land to the Indians that had previously also been burnt over by squatters. So not only was it unwanted land, it was burnt over land. This was serious enough, but the land was laid out in blocks with no roads. This resulted in the Indians having to pass through one another's land and the outcome was stealing quarrels and attacks on each other with cutlasses. And don't we see that still happening now? It's, it's kind of scary when you look at history from so long ago and look at things that caused certain problems and it's kind of scary to see that the problem still persists to this day. The problem still persists but what caused the problem is no longer even here. It's like those broken elephants in the in those circuses where they would tie the elephant to a pole and eventually they wouldn't even need to chain the elephant to the pole anymore because he is so broken, he believes like if he is still tied. A lot of Trinidad behaves like if we're still tied to the colonial powers. What do you think? See you in the next video.